Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay. All right. So um, the key concepts for today are we're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about MRI system components. So by the end, you should have at least a basic idea of what's involved in an MRI system. Uh, then we're going to get into some of the basic physics that we're going to have to understand to understand how MRI works. And we're going to talk a little bit about spin and magnetization, uh, precession of spins, then uh, RF excitation. And then if we have time, we'll start talking about uh, relaxation effects and, and sort of the, the governing equation for MRI. Right. So feel free to stop me uh, either online or in person. Uh, either way is fine. So this is the basic outline of an MRI system. And so uh, most MRI systems you see, although we'll look at some uh, counterexamples that later, are basically these big solenoids or big donuts. Okay, And so they look very much like a CT scanner, uh, but they're generally much larger than a CT scanner. Um, and the main reason is uh, this, they have this huge coil here that creates an immense magnetic field. And that's the main part of the MRI system. And then there's actually, one thing to remember in MRI system, there are typically three coils that we need to think about. There's the magnet, which is the big coil and that has, generates the biggest magnetic field. There are gradient coils, which will cause spatial, spatial variations in the magnetic field. And then there's gonna be radio frequency coils, which deliver energy into your object and also receive energy back from your object. Uh, then typically for this design, there's a patient table and similar to CT, it just, you zoom into the scanner. And then once you're in the middle of the scanner, then the imaging takes place. Right. So that's a fairly standard design. Uh, this is sort of an example of what that main coil looks like. Um, this is a cross section. Um, so it uses superconducting wire. So niobium titanium is typically what's used. And this is then cooled with liquid helium, okay? So basically we're using superconducting uh, magnets, all right? So basically these are very almost zero resistance magnets and essentially the current, once you charge up the magnet with current, the current just keeps going, all right? And, and the main thing to do is to make sure there's enough liquid helium to keep everything cold. So one thing we need to start talking a little bit about is, um, and that you're gonna have to get somewhat comfortable with in this part of the course is um, how to look at, uh, you know, sort of the, the, the different units we use, okay? So uh, typically in MRI, there's two main units we will use. One is Tesla. So we'll typically use Tesla, if, especially if we're talking about very large fields, okay? And, and then we will typically use Gauss when we're talking about smaller fields. Now, in America, in the US, we use both Tesla and Gauss. Okay, in Europe, they tend to use Tesla and millitesla. So everything is SI units. Okay, and so they don't tend to use Gauss as much. Right? But uh, it's useful to get a sense of how strong these magnets are. So most of the clinical magnets you'll see out there are on the order of a Tesla. Okay, and we'll see how, how big, how high the Tesla current magnets go. But one Tesla is equal to 10,000 Gauss. All right, so that's one thing to keep in mind. And then the thing to keep in mind is also that the Earth's field is about half a Gauss. All right, so this is a map here of the Earth's field measured all over. And here in San Diego, you can see we're about half a Gauss here. This yellow here is where we are here in San Diego. And the, the, the magnetic field varies over the Earth. And as you know, it sort of, you know, can also change directions over time, over, you know, tens of thousands of years. Um, but in general, this is what you use to guide your compass, your, you know, your compass aligns with, uh, the direction of the fields going north. So let's think about that. Half a Gauss is um, 0 0.5 times 10 to the minus 4 Tesla plus 50 micro Tesla. Okay. Another way to think about it is if one Tesla is 10,000 Gauss, then half a Gauss, so one Tesla is going to be 20,000 times uh, the Earth's magnetic field. Okay. So if I have one Tesla magnet, that's 20,000 times Earth's magnetic field. We have a three Tesla magnets, 60,000 times the rest of magnetic fields. These are really, really powerful magnets. Um, as part of the next homework, the first homework on MRI, you'll be asked to sort of, most of your iPhones or Androids have magnetometers in them. So you'd be asked to go measure magnetic fields around here, including close to where we have the MRI systems, okay? 
Okay, so this slide just gives you sort of a sense of the fields. Three Tesla is typically what high-end clinical scanners use. And so at here at UCSD, this is one of our research scanners, but we have quite a few uh, clinical scanners at Three Tesla as well. In fact, uh, aside from a few low field scanners, most of our clinical scanners now are at Three Tesla. So this, this is sort of the, if you're at a very sort of, um, you know, like an academic research center, you'll typically have Three Tesla scanners. And now the, uh, there is, as we'll talk about later, there is a really uh, huge pressure to increase magnetic fields because the higher the magnetic field, the more signal there is available. And the more signal there is available, then you can get better images. And so uh, there is, for example, seven Tesla is now the latest FDA approved field strength. So there are about a hundred of these in the world. They're super expensive. It's about at least $10 million for one of these versus a three Tesla, you know, you can get anywhere from one to $3 million, just depending on how well you negotiate, all right? But typically the, the general rule of thumb is it's a million dollars per Tesla. It's a very expensive modality. And plus the siting can be very expensive too. It might be, you might spend say $3 million or $2 million on your magnet and then it's gonna cost another million dollars to build a room and get everything all set. So it's, it's actually a quite expensive capital proposition. But seven Tesla is, is where sort of the field is heading clinically. Whether this takes over is still to be determined, but uh, people are certainly pushing this. And then on the research side, there's even higher. There's 9.4 Tesla, 10.5 Tesla, and 11.7 Tesla. And the one we spent a little time is just because there was just something in the news about it, is this 11.7 Tesla uh, magnet that just opened up in France from the Neurospin Consortium. Uh, this slide just shows essentially uh, sort of the distribution of magnets and, and sort of the history here. So you can sort of see in 2001, you had, um, you know, about 103 Tesla systems and maybe just one or two of these high field systems. If you go to 2015, now there's almost a thousand of these three Tesla systems, there's about 50 of these seven Tesla systems. And then you're seeing these higher systems being built as well. And then here in 2019, when this slide, I guess, was done was about 170 systems, and that's still about where it is. And then there's just a handful of these really high field systems, uh, typically built by these big labs or consortiums that are really trying to push the field forward. So to give you a size, this is the 11.7T uh, the in France, and this is the magnet here, right? And so this is a person here, okay? So these are huge pieces of equipment, okay? This consortium was actually, um, they had a bunch of engineers who were doing high energy physics, part of the CERN, you know, the particle accelerator where they used lots of magnets and, and they didn't have enough work for these guys. So they, they figured, well, let's make a project where we can make a really big magnet and make use of their, their expertise. And so that this project came out of that. So this project actually started, I think in probably 2005. And so it's been a 16 year project to get this up and running. And these are the first images that they just published uh, of a pumpkin, I guess, in Halloween spirit. So the inside of the pumpkin. Okay. I'm not. I don't think they have any human images yet. I, if they did, they probably would have pushed them. So uh, they're probably still undergoing some safety testing. Uh, this is what the magnet looks like, and you can sort of see it's it's a really huge magnet. And once again, you're here. You're seeing the coil, the main coil here, the main magnet. And then um, what you'll see here, and we'll talk a little about these. There are these other things called shielding coils. These are going in the opposite direction and they help reduce what's called the fringe shield of the magnet, which we'll talk about in a bit. Okay. You've also got here another coil. So here, this is a very small coil here, just for the head coil. And this is, the, in this case, this is a radio frequency coil just for um, transmitting RF. And then where do they have the gradient coils? I guess they're not really showing the gradient coils here. So anyways, this is a lot of power. So basically it's stored energy is over 300 megajoules of energy stored in this magnet. And it's got 1500 amps of current running through it. Okay, so this is a really powerful um, uh, magnet. And the main thing is people have made seven T's that are sort of where you can scan a head. This is the first whole body magnet where you can put the whole body into it, 11.7 T. Um, we just did a magnet upgrade, so I, we had some. I had some pictures I thought were 
sort of interesting to show. So this is this is our old magnet being decommissioned. And so what you see here is the helium being blown off. Okay, we're, we're, we have the magnetic field and we're trying to bring it down, reduce the field so we can move it. And so as part of that, we have to let all the helium blow off. Okay, so that's what you're seeing there. And then this, this is showing, and then you have to have these huge cranes that basically it lifts the magnet. This is the magnet going into, the new magnet going into uh, our center and that sort of drops through the, the skylight here. And as you know, they, they typically will come with some helium, but they have to top off helium into the magnet. And this is what the magnet looks like when it's done. It's a pretty nice design. And what you're seeing here is this, all this stuff is what's underneath the covers here. Okay. So in addition to the magnet, it used to be in the old days, a lot of electronics was all in another room and they had cables that went to the main magnet. But they found out that through those cables, they were losing a lot of power, getting a lot of noise, right? So with improvements in technology, they moved much of the electronics right onto the magnet, so the wires are much shorter. Yes, question. Uh, are most of our exporters with the helium the of the expensive. Yeah, it is expensive, and, and so we're, we're going to talk a little bit about people who are working on things to get away from that, because um, it, is, it is expensive, and it's also a limited resource. Right. I mean, there is only so much liquid helium in the world, and most of it came from uh, Oak Ridge, Tennessee. They basically, they, were, they had a nuclear research facility there, and as part of the experiments, they were creating, uh, you know, liquid helium. Um, but um, there was some, and they were sort of there was some law that said that they had to produce a certain amount every year, and when that law expired, all of a sudden there was a shortage, and I think I don't I haven't followed up. Uh, recently on what's going on, but there, there is still concern about, you know, whether there is going to be enough liquid helium. I think at that point, for example, like it was really hard to buy balloons, you know, like these helium balloons and there was a shortage in, of helium balloons even. Okay. Tom? Yes. Um, yeah. When someone asks a question, can you repeat the question? Oh, sure. Um, so the question was, isn't, um, the, you know, it, it's sort of the, the liquid helium and all that cooling seems to, it's very expensive. Right. That was the basic question, I think, right? Okay, yeah, thanks. Okay, so one thing I want you to get out of this lecture, and if you get nothing out of the MRI part of the course, is you got to respect the magnet. Okay. Um, unfortunately, there was just something in the news uh, just a few weeks ago of a, of a man dying in South Korea where someone came into the MRI room carrying an oxygen chain and it was ripped out of their hands and flew right into the magnet. Right. So the magnet field is incredibly powerful, and that's one of the most dangerous things about the magnet. Um, and so you always have to realize that the magnet, even if it's not making any sound, that current is still running. Okay. Sometimes people get fooled because typically a lot of these magnets, if you go into the room, will have a chirping sound. And then, but if that sound is off, people think the magnet's off, but it's not. That chirping sound is just part of the refrigeration system trying to recapture any helium that's boiling off. You can turn it off, and sometimes we do because we want to sort of, you know, check something and we're worried if that's causing some problem. But even if that's off, the current's still flowing. Okay. So the magnet is always on. And so whether you're a patient in a clinical scan or you're doing research, just realize that is the most dangerous part of the magnet for most cases. Question. Now, is the field so localized when you're doing like the transfer of the magnets? Like, if you have like a magnet that just blew up all the helium and like you said the current's low enough, you could safely carry it out and stuff without it having to worry about interacting with anything on the raised out of the building with the magnet and stuff like that. Yeah, so the question is, what? how do you move the magnet in and out of the building? So typically, you basically, it's called ramping down the magnet. You just bring it to a zero field. And, and then you still live, typically you still live, let a little bit of legal helium in it just because it's so valuable. But so you will actually transport the magnet. So for example, the magnet I showed you that was blowing off helium, that got sold to a broker who then sold it to some other place. And so there's like a black, you know, there's a used, there's a market for used MRIs, you know. Um, so that's, they'll, 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 re, they'll make it so there's no current while it's being transported typically. And then once it gets to the site, so that process is called ramping down. And when get, they get to the site, they essentially plug it into the wall and then they ramp up the magnet to field. Okay. Uh, great question. Um, yes. What's happening in the bottom left picture there? 
Oh yeah, I didn't get to that yet. So the question is, what's happening in that bottom left picture? Unfortunately, this guy, I think he survived. This was India. He was, I think he was probably working on the man. He wasn't a subject, but um, once again, someone brought in an oxygen cylinder and this guy is pinned, he's like pinned there, okay, to the magnet. And in this case, what they're gonna have to do is they're gonna have to quench the magnet, okay? So that's basically, there's, there's in every magnet room, there's this big red button called the quench button, which you should never push unless you really know that you wanna do that because it's sort of an expensive button to push, right? But if, if it's a life-threatening emergency, you definitely wanna push it. So in this case, they need to get the guy out. Maybe he's got internal injuries. They've gotta get him to the emergency room as quickly as possible. So this will blow off the helium and there's typically a big vent pipe so the helium doesn't go into the room. Because what, what's, what is the problem? What, can, what would you imagine would happen if we let the helium just go into the room? Yeah, try to let all the oxygen. And so basically the room would be filled with liquid helium. All the oxygen would be pushed to the bottom of the room, right? And so the other way you can die, not to scare you too much, but is you can, you can suffocate, right? So sometimes when people have been installing a magnet, there might be a leak and they're not aware of it. And all of a sudden they asphyxiate and then they pass out and they, there's no one there and they, they die because there's not enough oxygen in the room. Now, if you are ever in that case, then your best chance of surviving is getting to down to the floor and sniffing the oxygen, just crawling out of the room, okay? But hopefully you're never gonna be in that situation. Um, so in this case, they would have to press, someone would have to press the quench button, blow off the helium so the field, once, once things heat up, then the field is gonna collapse on its own and um, uh, then, then they can take the person out, okay? Now it's not just oxygen tanks. These are some examples of like gurneys that have been, I guess have a lot of metal in them that have been pulled into the magnet. Um, it doesn't seem they're in a hurry to press the quench button. Yeah, I, I don't know. I guess they're taking their video, their photos first. I get, you know, the guy with the camera, I think he should hit the quench button rather than take a picture. But anyway, that's just my opinion. Yeah, can you guys, can you guys hear in the room what Professor McVeigh is saying? Okay, great. Okay, so as part of the MRI, first MR homework, you'll be asked to watch this video, which is sort of a fun video of people playing around with magnets. Uh, so there'll be a qu couple of questions on the homework. It's pretty easy. Just watch the video, answer some questions. Um, the main thing to realize is the magnet's always on, okay? So the main, one of the main takeaway points from today is remember the magnet is incredibly powerful and it's always on. Okay, so let's do a little thought experiment here. So we're gonna imagine you're here, you're a person here, okay? and you come into the magnet room and you're holding, even though you were told not to do it, you're holding a wrench, okay? A steel wrench, okay? That can be magnetized. So you're here, you're holding a steel wrench, okay? And you start walking towards the magnet. Now it turns out the fields are not uniform, okay? They're, they're basically the fields sort of go like this, okay? And they wrap around, okay? And so there's, in this area, the fields are changing quite, a, quite quickly. And anytime you're in an area where fields are changing very quickly, there's gonna be a lot of force exerted at some point. So at some point, um, and none of you in this room is strong enough to keep that wrench in your hands. At some point, it's just gonna be ripped out of your hands. Okay, so let's imagine you walk towards the magnet and maybe you're, let's say you're about, uh, maybe you're one foot away when the magnet is, when the wrench is ripped out of your hands. Okay, so now I want you to think about what's gonna to happen to that wrench next. And, imagine, and let, let's say it's ripped out when you're right at the, the magnet is right at the sort of, the wrench is right at the, the center of that bore. Okay, one foot out away, but right at the center. So the, the wrench is ripped out of your hands. What happens next? Where's it gonna go? Go ahead. Yeah, and how far is it gonna go? Really far. really far? Is it going to go as far as forever or where will it stop? Okay, so it's going to go one foot past. Is that what you're going to say back there? No, it would be left or right. Okay, so let's say it goes to right. It's basically here, it's all potential energy, right? And then that potential energy gets converted into kinetic energy and it's going to zoom through the magnet. And then it's, it has to stop here, right? Because of the, and assume it's going so fast that gravity is not a factor. 
So it's going to stop one foot beyond the magnet. And then what? It's going to come right back at you. Okay. So that's really dangerous. And I, that's never happened to me, but I've talked to people who have almost lost a finger because of that. And the only reason it did, they didn't get hurt is because they weren't exactly in the center of the magnet, right? So there was some thing. And, and if you're lucky, it's going to hit the magnet on the way. You can just hit the walls of the magnet along the way. But um, it would be, it would just like that. So, um, so bottom line, uh, you got to respect the magnet, right? Okay, the next thing uh, I want to talk about. Professor? Is, yes, there's a question. Uh, I have a question. Yeah, so uh, would the wrench keep oscillating between A and E because of the magnetic fields? Well, at some point, gravity is also working on it. So, you know, assuming it was perfectly in the center, then it, eventually it would go down, right? Because grab, there's mm -hmm. another force of gravity, right? But mm -hmm. if okay. things were, it was perfect, it would certainly, it could certainly go back. Uh, many times, but in but, general, it's not going to be perfectly aligned. And also, you you know, just especially if it was a little ball, probably, but a wrench has many degrees of freedom. So as it's, as it's going along, um, it, it'd be maybe hard to explain. But yeah, I mean, it, it would eventually have to come down because of gravity, right? But isn't gravity a much smaller force compared to the magnetic force of the MRI machine? Yeah, so um, I don't really know. I, I can't say how long it would take. And, and in practice, mm -hmm. it would just hit start hitting the walls of the magnet and, okay. and the energy that way. All right. Great question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, what we saw in the, uh, the, the picture of the big magnet is there's the main magnetic field coils that create the main magnetic field. And then there's these other coils that go around it that tend to be a little less, these, the, these coils here, OK? And there's fewer of those, and those are typically what are called shielding coils. And these are just basically coils that go in the opposite direction to create fields that sort of counteract the, the main magnetic field. And the reason for that is because otherwise the magnet, magnetic fields go out too far, okay? And those fields that go out are called the fringe fields. And so this is an example of what the fringe fields look like on a magnet. You can sort of see here that, you know, very close to the magnet, you've got 2000 gauss. And then what you want to try to do is fairly quickly reduce the fringe fields down to five gauss. Okay, so five gauss is uh, sort of the requirement for anything outside of the magnet room or where, where anyone can just walk is has to be less than five gauss. Okay, so that's a safety requirement. So for example, if this was a magnet, we had a magnet in this room, the fields in this room could be more than five gauss. But any, because anyone who came in would be screened and everything like that. But anyone walking through the hallway, you know, does not, doesn't necessarily know there's a magnet in this room, right? So the field right outside the wall here would have to be five gauss, okay? So why would we want, why would we care what the fields are outside, especially in a hallway? It's probably not strong enough to pull a wheelchair, but what happens when you, go ahead. Possibly, possibly, well, but it was something more life-threatening, go ahead. Pacemakers, yeah, so that's the main reason, that's exactly right. So basically, remember, anytime you move through a magnetic field, it creates currents, electric field, or E equals, you know, dBdt, right, the Maxwell's equation, right? So it's gonna create electric fields, which can, can um, screw up with pacemakers, okay. Which is also one of the restrictions that you have a pacemaker, you really can't, at least at this point, really go into um, an MRI system. Uh, so anyways, the, uh, typically what's done is there's going to be metal shielding sometimes in, in the um, room. And so, for example, this is actually, we just actually had to go through this exercise earlier this year where uh, we were replacing a magnet in that room. And the new magnet actually had bigger fringe fields, which we didn't actually realize until sort of late in the process. We're like, oh, crap, you know. Are we going to have to spend a lot of, and these are, and, and there's already shielding. It turns out there was already shielding in the, uh, in the concrete wall, but to add more shielding would be very expensive, right? So, um, and so in fact, when we did that, we said that, well, we kept the magnet in the same place, the five, and there's a, there's a hallway, there's a public walkway here, which, you know, unfortunately was the only excess, it was like an emergency exit from the next building. So there was no way, you know, you could have people running through this walkway. So 
if they were so unlucky and had a pacemaker and ran right here, you know, there could be an issue. So even though only the five gauss line here only poked out a little bit into the public wall walkway, we had to make sure it was within the walls of the magnet uh, of the building. So in that case, we just ended up, we had the flexibility to move the magnet field, the, the magnet up, up in, the, in the room a little bit. So it's far away from the wall. So we could get those fields now pretty much within magnet. And so as one of your, uh, it'll be a bonus question on the homework, but one of your things is to actually go to this building with your iPhone and measure the magnetic fields back here and just verify that they're less than five gals, okay? So as I said, there are other, so the most typical design of magnets in the clinic is this, but you will see other magnetic designs. For example, uh, there will be these magnets like this, sort of like two donuts and you're in within the magnet. And then there's also um, magnets here, where it's sort of like a pancake and you go in here. So why would you want these other designs of magnets? Is there any, can anyone think of why you would go to the trouble of doing these other designs? Yeah, go ahead in the back. Yeah. Uh, no, not really, not really. Yeah, I mean, yeah, but it's a good thought, yeah. I mean, it doesn't really matter which way the magnetic fields go. I mean, you can you can position the person any way you want in the magnetic field. I mean, to first order now for certain things, you may be right because, as we'll talk about probably in a few weeks, there is an interaction of the magnetic field with um, with the with any object you put in, which can cause problems. Um, and and so that that it, it would be a very secondary factor, though. Yes. Uh, well, if you have those kind of pancake magnets. Distance to which you have an oscillating effect uh -huh. in terms of that radius between the center and the part, then like put in cameras or something inside the magnet. Right, like right. The radius is vastly decreased, so you don't have to have the risk of the you know, losing something in the field without the magnet. Yeah, that's a good point. Although for most of the depths, there's an no oscillation, it just goes right in and kills the person. So typically, what you're worried about is not the oscillation, but just the thing flying into the magnet and hitting someone. So, but that's, that's good. There's something in the back, someone in the back. Yeah, okay, so one thing is this could be a little more open. Yeah, so you could fit people into it. Yeah, good. Uh, there's one over here. I'll get back to you here. Yeah, over here on the left. Yeah, so that's actually one of the main reasons. So these magnets are very um, uh, sort of popular for people who are claustrophobic. Or, or for example, if you only need your like leg or your arm scanned, you know, there's really no reason for your whole body to go in, right? And, and so, so some people do get very claustrophobic in the magnet environment. So there is, an, there is a trend to sort of do that. Okay, there is a great point, yeah. Sort of in the filament, specifically the one where they're uh, vertical like that, uh, you don't have to lay down flat. Yeah. 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 That's 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 actually one of the things. So, for example, if they had a back issue and you want to look at their lumbar spine, you know, under load, you know, then you could look at that. Whereas if they're lying down, they're actually not under gravity load, right? It's also an interesting research question because, as we'll talk about sort of towards the end of the quarter, you know, one of the main uses of this in research is to study the human brain in action. So there's something called functional MRI where we there's thousands of scans done, you know, where people are where we we learned a lot about the brain by scanning people, but it's all while they're lying down, you know? And uh, think about most of your life, you're standing up or sitting up. And so it actually turns out what your brain, how your brain works is a little different when you're upright versus when you're lying down, which makes sense, right? Because, you know, when you're lying down, there's so, only so much you can do, whereas when you're upright, you can do a lot more. So there is this question about whether all the data, you know, a lot of the stuff we use to understand the brain is, it's not all wrong, but there's probably more to the story because um, we probably do want to start looking at the brain of people who are upright. Okay, so to get to sort of the, um, uh, one of the issues of liquid helium, so the manufacturers have realized this and also the liquid helium is actually has a lot of cost and there's also maintenance because it tends to boil off and you've got to sort of um, keep topping it off and you know, typically these magnets have really expensive maintenance contracts. Like you might pay $150,000 or $200,000 a year just for your service contract for a magnet to keep it running. 
Okay, and, and part of that is the liquid helium. Um, so there is a trend to uh, use a lot less liquid helium. So for example, this magnet from Philips used 1500 liters in a standard magnet, and they got it down with some really good engineering down to seven liters of liquid helium. And then here, this one that just came out from Siemens this year, is down to 0 0.7 liters of liquid helium. So with a lot of um, engineering that I don't understand, but basically by sort of um, making better use of the cooling and also making sure that there's no boil off of the helium. Uh, it looks like manufacturers are able to um, uh, lose, use less helium, at least for these lower fields, okay? I, I haven't seen anyone do it yet for the higher fields yet, uh, where there's actually a lot more current running. But for these lower fields, um, there it does appear to be a possibility to do that. Yes, question in the back. Yeah, so that's a good question. So ideally, you know, um, with a good design, you would never have to top off the magnet because as the magnet, as the helium boils off, there's a recovery system that recondenses it, sort of closed loop system. But if there's any issues with that, then you do have to come up and call what's, what's topping off the magnet. <laughs> sort of like in your car, like, you know, if you start losing a little gas and just top it off a little bit and just try to keep it filled up. You, you don't want they, the, the monitor, the levels are monitored all the time, typically remotely now, you know? And so once the healing levels start dropping, they know, oh, something's happening. And so you definitely want to do something before it gets too low. Okay. Okay, and then the other thing that sort of, there's a trend, we're gonna talk about two different trends. There's sort of a trend towards, one trend is towards bigger magnets, bigger bore magnets. So this is like the three max, magnet from Siemens that just came out that's this 0.7 liter magnet. This is like an 80 centimeter bore. And, and part of that is because at least in certain countries, people are just getting bigger. Okay. So there's on the one hand, people are going to bigger bores because it makes it easier for patient populations to accommodate larger people. On the other hand, there's also a trend now towards more portable magnets. And here's where you can, these magnets here don't use any liquid helium. They're all based on permanent magnets or uh, magnets without liquid helium. So either with wires, current running through wires, but um, not super cooled, or else in this case here, just a permanent magnet. And so this is actually, uh, I believe this came out a year or two ago, let's say 2020, yeah, this came out just actually last year. So this is, and this is the potential, you know, project as you're thinking about projects of, you know, sort of how does this magnet work? And, and this is uh, something that is essentially something like the size of an ultrasound machine, right? You can just wheel it around, just plug in the wall. And so this is sort of part of the trend of point of care. Basically, instead of having to go have the person go to the magnet, this is something where you could go to the person, right? So ideally, you know, at some point you could put this in a Walmart or your CVS and, and you could just go to your CVS and get your MRI scan done. Yeah. Now, I've heard like references to like, of course, MRIs are used for like lasers and stuff and they're obviously in the back of cars. Are those more of the permanent magnets that are being constructed or is that just like a portable? Powers, like, uh, Sorry, I missed the first part of your question. So, like, I've heard of force MRIs that can be used for, like, you know, horses and stuff. Like okay, that. And, okay. Like, they can, obviously, they have it in cars, they're not necessarily going to be like, like yeah. That yeah. Are those more like the permanent magnets or like the traditional MRIs? Like yeah, that's a great question. Unfortunately, I don't really know too much about veterinary MRI, so that's potentially interesting to look into. Um, they might use the two vertical ones, you know, like this similar where they could walk through it. That, that would probably be my guess. Is if, if I were to do, of course, MRI, that would be my, my guess. I mean, you know, we have scanned sharks and dolphins in the tube, in, in, the, in the horizontal magnet, but that's, that's a very, it's hard to do. You know, it's hard to, you have to sort of get the thing into there and keep them breathing and, and you know, have water in there. Um, so yeah, it's not the easiest technology for animals. Yeah, back there. Um, you know, it's, I mean, size does matter in terms of sensitivity. So for example, as we'll see, there, there is a, there's a big coil that sort of transmits energy in and receives out. And that's fairly homogeneous, but because it's far away from the body, it also, each coil picks up a lot of noise. And so there's an advantage to going 
having coils right on the body. And in fact, one of the trends, which uh, I'm not sure we'll get to that, but what is actually wearable coils where you just have a jacket that you put on. And that means it's picking up, each coil is only seeing the signal from a local part and it's not seeing the noise from the whole body. And then those coils would tend to be more limited by, um, uh, um, you know, sort of a bigger person, they would not penetrate deep enough. Um, so there, there, there would be, in, in general, the smaller the object is, the more you can pick up the signal. So there, there is some trade off there, but um, yeah. Okay, so, um, so, so far we've talked about the, the main magnetic coil. And then the other coils we need to talk about are RF coils here. Um, and then where are they? Oh, the gradient coils are here. Um, so we're going to go into that next. And, and before I do that, I just want to point out this website, mriquestions.com. This is like an amazing website. It's, it's a retired professor of radiology who just spends his free time now just writing about MRI and answering lots of questions. So if you have any questions about MRI that, you know, you, between lectures or something that you're just curious about or you're thinking about projects, this is really a great resource that uh, you should just know about. All right. Okay. So the next call we want to talk about is the radio frequency coil. So that coil is, a, is basically just a bunch, made of a bunch of copper typically. And so uh, its job is to create a very small magnetic field, typically ideally perpendicular to the main field. So this is the main field here. And this, this is called typically called B0. So the main field is called B0 and that's the big field. And then the radio frequency coil is typically called B1. Okay, And it's much, much less than the magnetic field. It's actually on the order of the Earth's magnetic field. So much, much weaker. Okay. But it's going to have a very important job, which we'll talk about. Right? And so this is the field that we transmit energy in, or radio frequency energy in, and then we receive the energy out. And it's typically done at sort of microwave type frequencies. Okay. So typically like anywhere from, you know, say 70 megahertz to 120 megahertz, or even higher for really high, high magnetic field scanners. So its job is to create, uh, and so you can imagine if you had to, you could create one of these fields by just having like a loop of wire, okay? And if you, typically what you do is you run current through this wire. And if you remember a little bit of your freshman or EM physics, then current running in a loop will create a B field around that loop, okay? And so typically you'll put current that's alternating, that's going sort of up and down as a sine wave. And so that this field will oscillate at some frequency, okay? So that's one thing, the radio frequency field is gonna oscillate in time. Whereas the B naught field is ideally uniform in both space and time. So um, there's many ways of doing it. Uh, one way is you have a big coil. So every scanner, most scanners will typically, unless they're a very specialized user scanner, will typically have what's called a body coil. So you can use this coil to both transmit to the whole body and receive from the whole body, okay? But as we'll get into later, there, there's disadvantages from receiving from the whole body. So uh, there's been a trend towards receive only coils. And these are the coils that are very small, but can be very small and also flexible that you can put right on the body. And because they're closer, then they can, they have a signal noise advantage. And as you can sort of see, I mean, if you had to just build one, these are sort of a lot of homemade coils that people built that they can look very simple. They're just like a loop. And their, their main job is just to receive signal from the body, right? And now there's a trend, uh, especially over the last 10 to 15 years of massively parallel arrays, okay? So you were taking this course 20 years ago, we'd be talking about one coil for transmit, one coil for receive. And that was the state of the art, okay? And then what happened is in the, uh, Late, 19, late 1990s, early 2000s, a bunch of really smart graduate students in different places came up, they, they saw sort of the way to use multiple coils, okay? And so that led to what's called parallel imaging, which we'll get to later in the course, where now the trend is to have many, many little coils. And then the, then the trick is how do you combine the information from all those coils? And it turns out by having all those coils, it allows you to do lots of things. And one of the lot of things it allows you to do is it allows you to go faster. Okay. And that's, as Professor McVeigh was alluding to in the CT, one of the disadvantages for MR in a lot of applications, it's still slow. Okay. And as we'll see later on, it's because we have to sort of raster through Fourier space, and that takes time. 
So these coils allow you to go acquire less data in Fourier space so you can go faster. And so that, that essentially revolutionized MR. That basically within a few years of that discovery, all the manufacturers were doing that. And so now if you go to any clinical scan, there will be typically, um, you'll typically be scanned with an array coil. Okay. And we'll talk a little bit about how that works later on, of course. Here's sort of, you know, a trim, you know, this is a huge array coil that just flies over the whole body. And so there is a one trend where similar to CT, where you know, you can just have the person go slowly through the scanner. And then it just does a whole body scan. Okay. Uh, this is an example of, for example, some 30 channel coils. These are commercially built. Um, but the first prototype of this, which was built uh, in Boston, was looked like this. So you can sort of see it's just a bunch of little circles. And each of these is an independent receive coil, which is receiving signal uh, from the object. Okay. Then after a lot of engineering, it becomes this. There's actually coils around the eyes here too. Okay. Question. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's RF coils, which we'll get back to RF in a little bit. Um, the next thing I want to cover is MRI gradients. Um, and so there's going to be three sets of these coils. There's going to be an X gradient, a Y gradient, and a Z gradient. All right. So it's a little different. So for the Typically for the, the main BNOC coil, there's just one coil, right? That's the main magnet field. For the RF coil, there's gonna be one, typically one big transmit coil, and then you can have lots of little receive coils, okay? And so that, that number, like, like for example, the system we just got can have 128 channels of receive, okay? So that's, that could be any number from, depending on how much money you have, right? So if you, have, if you don't have much money, you might get 32 channels. If you have a lot of money, you might get 56 channels. So. It depends on sort of what's in your bank. Um, but the gradients are always going to be X, at least for most things. There are variations of this now, but for most things you'll run across, there's an X gradient, a Y gradient, and a Z gradient. All right. And so, for example, you can imagine this is a Z coil here. And this is basically the simplest case is if you had current running this way in this coil and then current running the opposite way in this coil. That would tend to create a gradient in the magnetic field running along the Z direction, okay? And similarly, you can have very simple designs for the X and Y gradients. But typically what's done is the actual design of gradients that work really well over a big enough volume to be useful, you'll see they have much more intricate patterns, okay? And so this is an art in and of itself. So this is someone actually uh, building a gradient coil. It looks like, I think this is in, the, uh, in Germany at the Siemens factory. And this is actually still somewhat of a handmade art in terms of, you know, oftentimes it's like they'll be bending these by hand or, or pounding them in by hand. And, and so there's still quite a lot of uh, craftsmanship that goes into these coils. Right. Okay, so a little bit about what these coils do. So we want to start introducing some notation so we can sort of you know, start working with MRI and, and sort of understand how people think about MRI. So we're going to say that typically we're only going to be interested in the Z component of the field. Okay. So when we're, we're looking at the field, we're, we're looking at the Z component of the field. And the main, the biggest component of that is the B naught. The main field is the biggest component of that. Okay. And the Z direction is for the, for the, um, for the bore, the horizontal bore, which is going along that axis, all right? And on top of that, we're gonna add these gradient fields here, okay? And so it's gonna be a GXX plus GYY plus GZZ. So the GX is the gradient and X is the location, okay? So GXX, GX uh, times X is gonna give you like a delta BX field in the Z direction, all right? So what do those gradients look like? For example, let's say I have a gradient in the Z direction. That means dBZ dZ is greater than zero. So once again, I'm looking at the Z component of the field and then I'm just seeing that that gets stronger as I move along the Z direction. So that's a Z gradient, okay? And typically these fields are much, much less than the main field. So for example, we said that the main field might be tens of thousands of greater, you know, tens of thousands of gauss, right? These fields are on the order of 
over like a centimeter, a couple of gauss per centimeter. Okay, so over some range is just a few gauss. Okay, so these are much smaller fields. So we're making tiny perturbations in the in the main field, and we're going to see how that allows us to create uh, the Fourier transform. Similarly, by like a GY, that's the gradient of BZ, still the Z component in the Y direction. And so as I move along the Y direction here, you can sort of see that that BZ component is getting bigger. So that's what the gradient looks like. Okay. And these are some examples of how you could make gradients. Um, so for example, what we said about is if we had two counterwound coils, then this would cause, you know, field that's positive in this direction or pointing this way in this direction and pointing the other way in that direction. And so this would be a gradient field like if you plot it as a function of time, as a function of space, it would be varying like that as a function of z. Okay. So it's, point, it's positive here and it's negative here. So that's my z gradient. And this just explains how you can think about this has a field that's going this way, um, plus a field that's going this way. Oh wait, c z gradient is on. Okay, so here's, here's a way to think about it. So we have the main field here, b0, we add on this gradient field, and that creates some linearly um, changing field. Now, this is really into scale because remember, these variations are much, much smaller than this overall variation. Okay. This is just an example of how sort of intricate these designs get. Okay, so they're, they're basically at that point, there's a lot of, even there's still some hand involvement, there's also a lot of computer machining and milling of these coils. Uh, and one of the things about these coils that just sort of is a huge fact is um, these coils, you, basically these coils, as we'll see later, we're going to want to change the current in these coils very quickly because by changing the current, that's what allows us to go through Fourier space and collect our data. So these coils are, the current in these coils is a lot of current. For example, um, uh, typically, you know, you might have like a thousand amps of current uh, or in 100 amps of current going through one of these coils. And so, um, let's see, is that? Okay, well, I'll, I'll have to get the specs on that later, but um, they basically are oscillating, the, the, these, these, the, the currents in these, these coils oscillate typically the audio frequency. So as we'll see later, uh, they, these coils actually make sounds, okay? And so the magnet can actually, you can actually program the magnet to talk to the person. Okay, because they're, they're actually operating at audio frequency. And so they're essentially like really big audio amplifiers that we put in the magnet. So for example, uh, for modern systems, each of the channels will have like a me one megawatt gradient amplifier, okay? And for comparison, uh, I think when I looked at it, in the Metallica 2017 World Tour, uh, it was only 367,000 watts of audio amplifiers they had. So what it means is you could actually go into an MRI room and take out these amplifiers and, and then have a big rock concert, okay? Because that's how much current there is. Um, okay, so putting it all together, this is sort of what a console looks like. So typically there's going to be an MRI system in a magnet room and that's gonna be closed off. It's gonna be in a room that's typically RF shielded. So it's gonna be copper in all the walls so that RF energy doesn't get in and contaminate the signal. The person will stand stand out here with a uh, you know with a console and and, and um, you know control the system. And so you can sort of see here. Here's the magnet. We've got things controlling the gradient. We've got things controlling the radio frequency. You can program these, and we'll talk a little about pulse control programming in a minute. And then the data goes in and it's digitized, and then. Uh, you know, you run it through MATLAB or C or whatever to reconstruct your images. Okay, so that's the, um, the general overview of NMR system. And so now we're gonna talk a little bit about how there's really, we're gonna cover uh, four main concepts of what all these things have to do, okay? So the first one is polarization. So what is that? Polarization means that's gonna create that's the job of the big magnet, okay? And that creates magnetization that we can use. Okay. So what happens is without the magnet there, there is magnetization, but it's pointing in all different directions. So it all cancels out. So there's nothing to work with or very little to work with, okay? So the big magnet comes along and it creates, it aligns things to create magnetization 
such that we can work with. And the bigger the magnet, the more magnetization it creates. So we have more signal to work with. Okay, so that's the first thing we'll talk about. The second thing we'll talk about is excitation, which is now that you create that magnetization, you want to do something with it. The excitation is moving that magnetization away from its equilibrium point. Okay, and that's by pumping energy into the object with the coil. The next thing is encoding. Okay, encoding is how do we make an image? Okay, so this is really the, the image formation part. Uh, without this part, we can't make an image. And so the encoding is the job of the gradients. The gradients cause different parts of the body to act differently, right? Because they have these spatially varying gradients. And so that allows us to distinguish different parts from each other. And the last part is integration or receive. The RF coil, whether it be the big RF coil or one of these smaller coil, it's basically going to look at the signal from a patch of the object and integrate all that, that magnetization together. Okay. So essentially, instead of an integration in MATLAB, the coil is integrating all the signal together. All right. So those are the three parts. So there's actually four things, polarization, excitation, encoding, and integration. Okay. So we'll walk through those and, and hopefully by the end of the course, I'll have a better sense of how these things come together to create an uh, MR image. And then plus how this gives a lot of flexibility. I think one of the things that Professor McVeigh may have alluded to already is that MRI, one of the powers of MRI is that it can create lots of different contrasts. And we'll see some of that here, but it, it's just a very flexible system. And it also had, a, it also evolved very closely with academia, okay? And so the manufacturers have been very open about allowing grad students, postdocs to program these, these um, systems. So they're fairly open compared to CT, which is often very closed. Okay? So a lot of the innovations actually have come from academia. A lot of the innovations that you'll see on clinical scanner were invented by graduate students. And so the manufacturers know that, so they know it's to their advantage to let this information out, hoping that you know, one of you is gonna create the next best um, you know, technology. So this example, these are, these are all the types of images. These are just five types of images that you can acquire with MRI with the same system just by changing the software, okay? So for example, you can create just basic images of anatomy. This is the same brain in the same scan session. And just by changing some parameters, you can sort of, you can highlight here, cerebral spinal, spinal fluid here is white, so very bright. And here it's very dark, okay? And here it's sort of, uh, uh, mixed contrast, okay? You can create an image of the blood vessels without any contrast. You know, you don't have to inject anything. You can create an image of what the blood vessels look like. Here you can get, this is uh, based on how much iron is in the vessels. And so you can get an image that's sensitive to how much iron is in the vessels. And so this is venous weighted. So the deoxyhemoglobin, as we'll talk about, is where the iron is, right? You can get, uh, these amazing maps of the wiring in your brain, okay? Or, or else even the muscle fibers in the, in the heart using something called diffusion imaging, which we'll talk about, okay? And so this is pretty amazing. I think I still find this really amazing. I mean, you can put, I can put any of you in the scanner for about eight to 10 minutes, okay? Just put you in, take you out, and that will allow me to get a wiring diagram of your brain, okay? I can see how your brain is wired. The longer I put you in, the better that wiring diagram will get. But it's still amazing that you can actually do that in you know 10 minutes without any contrast agent at all. Okay. And then this one is uh, functional MRI where you're actually seeing the brain activity fluctuate with time. And once again, that's without any contrast agents, just looking at endogenous fluctuations in, in the brain activity. So we'll get to uh, some of these images um, as we talk about MRI more, but um, just at this point, just want to emphasize that one of the things as you're thinking about projects, I know you still have to do the CT project, but once you're done with that, it's a good time to, you know, you can start thinking about, well, what, what, what I want to do. One thing to realize is there's just a lot of different things you can measure with MRI. Okay, so we're going to switch gears a little bit. We have about 25 minutes. So we're going to start now sort of getting into a little bit of the physics of MRI. And we're just going to give a very high level view so you understand enough to sort of understand how it basically works. Um, so one thing that uh, you will talk about if you 
hang around MRI physicists or engineers. Uh, there's a lot of talk about spin, okay? And, and so, and protons and precession and things like that. So we need to understand some of those concepts. So spin is an intrinsic property of elementary particles. It's essentially intrinsic angular momentum of electrons, protons, and neutrons. And spin is quantized. It's a key concept in quantum mechanics. But we're gonna take a more classical viewpoint of it here because for the purposes of what we're doing, we don't need a quantum mechanical understanding. Uh, the next thing is that there's a, there's a connection between magnetic moment and angular momentum. And so one way to think about that is, imagine you had a charged sphere, right? Let's say I took a ball and just put a bunch of electric charge on it, right? And then I spun that ball around, right? So that's spinning around, it's angular momentum, right? And that charge moving around is essentially current, right? So what does a current loop create? It creates magnetic fields, okay? So to first order, you can think about, um, the uh, uh, these these you know the classical picture is just a charged sphere spinning around its own axis, right? And so it turns out there's a relationship where the magnetic moment mu is equal to gamma, which is a gyromagnetic ratio, which we'll get back to later, times s, which is a spin angular moment. Right? And uh, typically for MR, the main thing we're going to talk about is the hydrogen proton. Okay, and this has spin one half. And it turns out that, um, you know, you, we can do imaging with these other things that have spin one half, for example, carbon 13, fluorine 19, sodium, phosphorus, or oxygen. But these have, tend to have very low abundance. And so most of what we'll exclusively talk about in this course is things based on the hydrogen proton, because there's a lot of it to image, right? Okay. So we, if we go back and think about a classical picture where we have current going through a coil. So let's say I have a current, some current I, and this has some area A, and this is just a unit vector N hat. So this would be you know, N hat would just be pointing in this direction. Then it's gonna have some magnetic moment that's basically pointing in that direction, okay? So if you go back to, for example, your right hand rule and imagine, you know, the current going around and all the fields going back and summing up, there's going to be some magnetic moment pointing up. All right. So one other thing we want to think about is if I have a magnetic moment in the presence of a B field, then we want to think about the energy state. So for example, if my magnetic moment is pointing along the direction of the main field, that's its lowest energy state. And then to get it turn it this way and point down, that's gonna be its highest energy state. Cause I have to put, I could exert energy, I could do work to do like this, right? Because like, for example, if you have a compass needle, right? You know, like a compass, because everyone knows what a compass, right? Is, right? I'm not sure about this generation in terms of it. Has anyone not seen a compass in real life? Okay. Well, if you haven't, there are these things that have a needle and they point north. Okay, now you don't need one now because you can just use your iPhone, right? And it has a magnetometer in it. But, um, you know, uh, when I was growing up, you know, we would even make them ourselves. You would take a needle and you magnetize it, you put it in a fork and just put it in water and you could just you would point towards the, the, the magnetic field, right? And then if you were gonna, so it's gonna point north. Now, if you wanna make it point south, you're gonna have to turn that needle, right? And that's gonna, you have to do work to do that. So this is gonna be lowest energy state when it's aligned with the field and its highest energy state is when it's anti-locked, okay? So one concept is, depending on your relationship to the main field, there's gonna be different energy states. Okay, and so this is the compass needle, sort of pointing along the Earth's magnetic field. So one concept that's important to realize is that if you have just a bunch of random particles, right, in a main magnetic field, which way will they tend to point? Will they tend to point with their first magnetic field or against their Earth's magnetic field? So let's say I had a bunch of, of, of compass needles in here and I had them in boiling water. So there's some random motion to each one. On average, like if there was no magnetic field, they just all point off in whatever direction they are, right? But on average, if I, if I have a magnetic field, some of them are gonna tend to point along the field. Some will still point against it, right? Because they're random motion. But if I take a snapshot 
I'm going to tend to find more that are aligned with the magnetic field than those that are aligned against it. So we're going to have what's called a Boltzmann distribution, which is sort of this exponential decay where this curve shows sort of how many things are aligned with the field. So this shows the probability. So here, higher probability that you're going to be with the field and fairly low probability that you're against the field and somewhat intermediate probability that you're going to be perpendicular to the field. Okay. Uh, I think still the nicest explanation of this I heard is from a solid state physics professor who said that one way to think about this is like, you know, if you look at say like the Gilman parking structure, right? And assume there's no A or B or student passes, right? So you can just park wherever you want. So if you did that experiment, you would tend to find the lower levels occupied. Most people are just gonna to wanna to go in and park on the closest parking spot they can, right? That's the lowest energy solution, right? You're, just, you're trying to get somewhere, you're just gonna park. If the first level is open, you're gonna park there, right? But a few people are just like got a lot of energy or want to test out their car and they're going to go all the way to the top, right? But you're going to find like an exponential, you know, uh, occupancy level in your, in your garage, right? So that's another way to think about it. So what that means is if I don't have a magnetic field applied, then the spins can sort of point in any direction they want, right? There's no preferred direction for that point. So I think about adding up all these vectors, you know, putting all their origins at the, or at, Putting all their arrow, putting all those origins with their tail ends at the origin, and their heads are all going to point out different directions. So they're going to sum up to zero, right? So this means zero net magnetization. Now, if I apply a magnetic field, then there's going to be high probability that they're going to point along the magnetic field, and lower probability they're going to point against the magnetic field, and then other probabilities that they're going to point in random directions. And so that's that preferential uh, probability, you know, sort of that, that distribution is going to cause me to have a net magnetization, okay? And it turns out that magnetization, which we call M0, is proportional to how many spins there are, but it's also proportional to the B field, okay? So the bigger B field I have, the bigger I can make that magnetization. And that's what drives going to higher and higher fields because the more signal you have, then the better your SNR is. Okay, so that's sort of, so that's polarization. That's creating the magnetic field. Okay, so that, that creating that M sub zero is polarization. That's the job of that big magnet. Okay, and the bigger that magnet, the more M sub naught I can create. Okay, the next concept we want to talk about is torque. Okay, because what, and what this is going to lead into something called precession. And I'll do a little demonstration of that in a minute. Um, which is basically, if I have, something rotating around its own axis has angular momentum in the presence of an external field, it's going to tend to process around that field, okay? And this is really important and we'll do a demo of that in a minute. And so here's the idea that this, this is the magnetic moment here, okay? And you imagine that's rotating around its own axis, okay? Now, there's gonna be tend to be a force that's gonna to try to align it with the main field, right? There's, a, there's gonna be something that wants to go to the lowest energy state, right? Um, and so that torque, that, that torque that applied is mu cross B, okay? Um, and so for a non-spinning magnet, if there's no angular momentum, that torque will try to just align it. So that's like if you take a cup needle and you take it away from north, it's always gonna go, on, go back to north. Okay, so that's the torque applied. So if you have a compass needle that's not spinning around to an axis, it will just go back to north, right? Now, if you now have precession, then it's got an angular momentum. And so it turns out the change in angular momentum is equal to that torque. And so if you run through that, it turns out that you can end up with this expression here where d mu dt is equal to mu cross gamma b. So that means the change in that magnetic moment is equal to the cross product of the magnetic moment and the b field. Okay, so if I have, this is the B field and this is the magnetic moment, then that cross product is gonna point like perpendicular to this. Okay, so here, that's gonna point this way. And so it's gonna cause a perpendicular uh, uh, force this way. And then that's, it's always gonna be perpendicular. So it's gonna cause it, that, that is gonna cause it to, to go around like that. Okay, so I'm gonna go pick up a thing here. So let me see, I guess, well, I think this should work for both in-person and uh, Zoom, right? 
Okay, so let's say that this is our spin, right? So what's what's the force acting on this now? Gravity, right? So gravity is the force, right? And so is this in its lowest energy state or its highest energy state? Yeah, it's obviously in its lowest energy state, right? So what do I have to do to put it in its highest energy state? Yeah, I gotta flip it around like this, right? Right, so now it's anti-line. And then if I let go, where's it gonna go? Right. So that's just like the compass symbol, right? It's gonna align, it's gonna go to its lowest energy state. Okay. So now let's say I perturb it, and this is this is remarkably like what we're gonna see in MRI, which is the magnetization before we see it is just in this energy state. It tends to be in a slow energy state, right? There's an M naught. Okay. So uh, in this case, the M naught, let's say, was pointing down. Okay. Now, if I perturb it, let's say I, add, I do some work, right? So, doing this is what the R field is going to do, right? I'm going to put energy into it to move it away from its equilibrium state, right? This is this is going to be this is a 90 degree rotation, right? I've gone 90 degrees, right? This is going to be exactly analogous to the 90 degree flip angle that we do with MRI. So, when we talk about 90 degree flip angle, we can think of it as just doing that. Right, 90 degrees, right? Now, as we said, if this has no angular momentum, it's just going to go back there. Okay. But it turns out spins have angular momentum, right? And so hopefully, you, so most of you have seen this demonstration. If I give this angular momentum, now it's going to process. Okay. And this is exactly what the spins do. Okay. They're always processing around their own axis. And then if I tip them away, then they're also going to process around this main field. So this is what we're going to take advantage of. And the rate of procession okay, is going to be, is going to, we're going to use the gradient fields to vary how quickly it processes, such that a proton in one location is going to process differently from a proton in another location. So that's going to allow us a greater image. So we can tell, oh, you're here because you're processing at this frequency, and you're here because you're processing at another frequency. So that frequency procession is known as the Larmor frequency. So that's an important term. So it's basically related to omega in, in radians per second is equal to gamma. This is the gigantic ratio again, times B, which is the main field. Okay, just revisiting, uh, we already looked at this one test equals 10,000 gauss. Now we're gonna introduce gamma, what are typical, um, for, this is gamma for hydrogen proton. So, um, you know, you can express it in different terms, um, but let's look at this one. This is, says gamma is 42.58 megahertz per Tesla, okay? So that means if I have a one Tesla magnet and I look at the protons processing around, they're all processing at about 43 megahertz, okay? If I have a three Tesla magnets, maybe about 27, 127 megahertz, okay? So this is essentially a roughly around the, the FM range. Right. You know, that had a range like 88 to 103 megahertz, right? So we're talking about radio frequencies to close to FM range. It's more close to the civil aviation band, which will means that if you're close to an airport, you might have more issues. Okay. So this is some a dramatic ratio. So you can sort of see it varies across nuclei. So hydrogen protons, what we just talked about. So 42.58 megahertz. And as we said before, one of the big one of the big reasons we do uh, proton imaging is because of the abundance, right? You've got 88 molar versus millimolar concentrations for other uh, uh, protons. So the sensitivity is related to both the gamma and the abundance. And you can sort of see if this has a sensitivity of one, these all have very low sensitivity. Okay. So this is a lot more frequency again. And uh, so, for example, for 1.5 T, it's about 64 megahertz. And this is just showing, uh, yeah, at 3T, for example, we're right in the civil aviation band. Okay. So that's one of the reasons why we have to put the magnet uh, in a shielded room so that no environmental arc energy can get in there. Because okay. if it's at the same frequency as the protons are processing, then this, the scanner doesn't know where the energy is coming from. And so it's going to say, well, you know, it's going to use that as part of the image. Okay, so uh, typically we're never looking at one single proton. We're looking at things in some volume. And so we can think of summing up all the protons in some volume. Uh, so this is, for example, if we took all the protons in volume and just smashed them together, 
And then the overall magnetization is whatever magnetization there is in that small volume. And that also follows the same equation of motion because it's just made up of each of these uh, spins. Okay, so now we're gonna, I think the last concept we'll talk today is we're just gonna go through some, uh, yes, question. Um, so when we see the calculus, it's the whole notation for a vector that we just assume for a drawn out there a three dimensional vector. Yes, that's right. So magnetization, yes, it was bold. Um, it will, it, it is definitely a vector. And so, um, yeah, so uh, both magnetization and the B field, the, mag the, the magnetic field will have three components to it, X, Y, and Z. So once again, to remind you, the Z component is always the B zero. Okay, so that just has a Z component. But then the RF field and the gradients, um, the RF field can have X, Y components. For the gradient, we're really just going to also look at the Z component. Um, but the, the, when we talk about RF, we'll look at X, Y components as well. All right. So let's just talk a little bit about what RF excitation is. And so remember, the RF excitation in terms of this example here, we basically, it's putting energy into the system to get away from its equilibrium state, all right? So we're trying to like give all, if this is like, if you imagine the tip of this as being the magnetization vector, it's tipping it from here to here, okay? So that's shown here. So for example, we sort of change the sign. This has got some net magnetic moment um, aligned with the B field. And so what we're trying to do is we're gonna to try to tip that moment from pointing this way to pointing, you know, 90 degrees away. Okay. The phase doesn't really matter now, we could tip it anyway, but for now, you know, just, just the main thing is we're tipping it 90 degrees away from its equilibrium. Okay. Um, so that's shown here where you can sort of, so everything's processing, right? Even if before you tip it, all this stuff is processing, then the whole ball just rotates, it keeps processing, but as it's processing, it's also, as you put energy in, you see it's going away from equilibrium. And we can even go past 90 degrees here. It's actually being flipped almost to 180 degrees. And I think it's going to come back. Okay. Okay. So here's the thing that we have this really big magnetic field, right? And things want to process around it, right? And, but we somehow want to, and, and really wants to be aligned with this field. We somehow wanted to get away Somehow we want to make it go away from this field, right? Which is like trying to move a really big object, right? And, but we want to do it with a really tiny field because we don't, and the reason why we can't use a big field is because when we're putting this energy, our radio frequency energy in, it's like a microwave, right? If we put too much energy in, what's it going to do to our object? Like what does a microwave do? Yeah. Yes. So one of the issues that's tightly regulated is when you put RF energy into an object, it's going to tend to heat tissue, right? So obviously, it's no good if you cook your subject, right? So you really can't have arbitrarily large B1 field that you put into your object, because if you do that, you're going to end up burning the object or cooking them or, or doing something, okay? So that's why you're sort of limited in how much B, the B1 field can be. But what you do have is you can make that RF field go at a frequency, okay? And it turns out there's gonna be some advantage to having it go at the right frequency. So let's do a thought experiment here. So, um, well, let's do this thought experiment first. So let's imagine, I don't know why this person has a car on this swing, but they do. So obviously this, this probably weighs like 2000 pounds or something, right? So it's a big object. So let's say I say, okay, I want you to go up, to the, but it's on a swing, right? So I want you to go up the object with your pinky finger, right? And I want you to get this object swinging, right? So how would you do that? How would you push that object to get it swinging? Go ahead. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's the thing. You could get it swinging if you very carefully, you know, everyone has pushed someone on a swing, right? If you push them at the wrong time, what happens? It's like a collision, right? So anytime you have a big op, big thing and you're trying to move it with a small thing, you've got the only thing you can do is use that resonant frequency and that's the way you're gonna get it oscillating, right? Similarly, let's say uh, this is a merry-go-round. It's a merry-go-round 
you know, someone is, let's say you have your friend, let's say this is your friend, on a horse on the merry-go-round and you have a little thread, right? And your job is to pull that person off the merry-go-round, okay? So what should you do to per pull that person off the merry-go-round? And if you, put too, if you use too much force, that thread's gonna break, okay? So once again, your friend's on a horse on a merry-go-round, you have this thread that's a three foot long thread and you're trying to pull that person off the merry go round. What should you, how should you do that? Any thoughts? How could you do it without breaking the thread? Go ahead. Well, every time, like, you're thinking about the whole bit, like, how you get out of the whole bit in place, it's like you can parallel to the person, but just slightly off, so most of them are right in the middle. Yeah. But just like a little bit off. Yeah. Out of the perpendicular normal direction. Yeah. Uh, slowly. Over time, pitch them all without like, yeah. And so, what would you be? Need, what would you need to do? What would what, what are you stationary or are you moving? You're moving. Yeah. And what? How fast are you moving? Exactly. Yeah. So if you ran along the merry round, you could pull this person off, right? It might take some time. You might take a few rotations, but that's your only hope of doing it. Because anything else, you're going to break that thread. Yeah. So it's the same principle with MR. Essentially. I have this, let's say I have a spin here, it's pointing up, and this is the main magnetic field, right? I have a no, another thing here, right? Which is going to, I have a little itty bitty field here, right? Okay. And that little itty bitty field can sort of tend to, so there's a strong tendency to process around this field, right? This little itty bitty field, there's a, strong, there's a little bit of tendency for it to process away. Right, just a little bit, right? And then as it's going to process away, but it's also going to want to process this way. So there's you're sort of trying to tip it away, but as long as you follow that tipping, as long as you go away with that procession, then you can sort of slowly, slowly get it to come down. So you can basically spiral it away, similar to that mirror ground thing. Okay. This little itty bitty field can tip it away just a little bit, but but if you can do it at the right moments, all those little tugs on it can slowly get this to come down, all right? So that's what's shown in this movie here, where you sort of see that this RF is in cyan, it's going around at the right frequency, and it's, it's doing it such a way, it's always it's able to tip this down. Whereas here on the right, when we play this movie over here, you're, it's not gonna be the right frequency. So this is gonna be an example of like, you're, you're not running around the marriage run at the right rate, right? Even if you're like, you know, one centimeter per second off running around a nerve around, it's not going to be as effective, right? So that's shown here where the field is spinning around, but it's not at the right frequency. Okay, it's not on resonance. So the magnetization might be perturbed a little bit, but it's going to be sort of stuck. Okay, so the key concept is yes, whoops, sorry about that. The key concept is yes, we can excite the magnetization, but we have to do it on resonance. Um, and finally, the last thing I want to talk about before we end is something called the rotating frame. And we'll pick up on this later. Uh, we'll, we'll just do one or two more slides. Is essentially, you know, everything is rotating around, for example, like 100 megahertz per second, right? Or 100 megahertz, 100 million cycles per second. But it's sort of very hard for us to think about things that are going around all the time, right? The physics tends, to, the equations tend to be sort of bulky. So, we are going to look at things in a rotating frame of reference. Okay, so that's basically we're all in a rotating frame of reference now called the Earth, right? Oops, let me get rid of that. Let's see, let me get rid of that. There we go. Um, and um, or also, rotating frame of reference might be if you're if you're in the lab frame of reference and you're looking at your friend on the mirror around, looks like they're going around, right? But once you hop onto that mirror around, they're not moving, right? They're just right in front of you. So the rotating preference is you're gonna get, it's you're, you're, you're gonna go along with the spin and process with the spin, and that's the rotating frame of reference. So where that's useful is, for example, if we're in the lab frame of reference, then that tipping is this very complicated spiraling down, right, that we talked about. But if I'm moving along with the spin, then it just looks like the spin is just coming down towards me. Right, because I'm running around with the spin, so just coming towards me. And so that's shown here in the rotating frame of reference. 
we can just think of it more simply as just tipping this spin over like that. Okay, so that's going to be useful to think about both for RF and also when we talk about uh, encoding. Thinking about the reference frame of the spin so we can sort of take out that overall rotation. Okay, so that's all we have for today for MRI. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to post, I mean, this is going to be like a two or homework assignment. It'll be fairly easy to do, mostly watching videos, maybe doing some measurements, you know, uh, maybe a little bit of MATLAB, but you'll have two weeks to do it, but you can sort of, it, it should be it's something that you could do in a week if you wanted to. So, but I'll, I'll, I'll post either today or tomorrow just so you have it in case you want to work on it, but it's certainly something you could also start after the projects are, are in, but just so you have it. Um, and then for the projects, um, Professor McVeigh and I uh, are going to be in this room for the projects. So the way it's going to work is if you want to come to the room, we, we, we sort of think that it's, you know, for those of you who want to come in person, you know, it, it's sort of a little more fun to be here in person and see people actually talking. Um, the way we'll do it is we'll still broadcast over Zoom, but just come in prepared to log into Zoom with at least one computer for your group. And then we'll just change sharing the screens. And that will, the nice thing about Zoom is it, it sort of gets rid of this sort of, you know, who's hooking up your computer and everything and waiting one minute for the display to sync, right? So, so we're gonna do it over Zoom, but there's, Professor McVeigh and I will be here in person. So uh, if you wanna come in person and present, then you can present, if you wanna be remotely, uh, you can be remote. Um, and other than that, Professor McVeigh, did you wanna say anything about the projects? Um, I don't, I don't think so. I think that, you know, just to make it clear that, uh, the team should have, uh, the, uh, presentation loaded up on a, on a computer and we trade, you know, the sharing the screen and then, you know, you can either pass that computer if you're here, um, or pitch in, you know, uh, just by voice and have one person move the slides forward. If you're going to share the, the presentation between people, um, you know, you, you can have uh, someone moving the slides forward and the other person talking over the slides. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the one issue that Tom and I were wondering about is uh, the audio. When everyone's in their own room and you're using Zoom, the audio is fairly simple. When there's a group of us in uh, Paul Fucht in the in the hall, then the audio, um, if everybody has their audio on, that might be an issue, right? We might get a lot of feedback and things like that. So um, probably we'll have one computer in that room with its audio on and we'll put the mic beside that computer. That's our plan. We're probably gonna test it. <laughs> And see how that's going to work. Yeah, it's where I mean, everyone can hear Professor McVeigh, right? So it does seem like just having the mic close to the computer works. Okay. All right. Well, I, I think that's good. And then, you know, if I let me just try sharing my screen, Tom. Okay. And uh, I gotta stop sharing my screen then. Okay. So if I do that, okay. Can you see my screen up on there? Yeah, we can see it. All right, great. So, so that's the way we'll do it. And, um, you know, you can give your PowerPoint uh, presentation or, or display PDF or whatever it is you want to do with a shared screen. So are there any questions about that from the class? Okay, question in the back. Yeah, and also be able to log into Zoom. Can you repeat the question, Tom? Yeah, so the question is, we just have to have our computer with the slides on it, and then also be able to log into Zoom so you can share your presentation. Yeah, now we run into difficulties. I mean, obviously we can, you know, I'll, I'll bring a USB stick or, you know, we can sort of email things back and forth. But I think I think you're supposed to submit your presentations beforehand anyway, right? so they'll all be on Canvas, is that right? Was that part of it or no? No, okay. I Okay, I'll talk to so so. Um, do we want people to submit their presentations on Canvas beforehand, anyways? Uh, I would say it would be a good backup is to have all of the PowerPoints loaded onto one of our computers just in case. Yeah. Um, so that would be terrific if people could um, upload their presentation. Yeah. So I think as a backup, if you can upload your presentation 
onto Canvas, you know, then if we run into difficulties and we can always pull it up on our computer. Um, I mean, it's the first time we're doing it this way, obviously, you know, new way of doing things, but I think, I think it should work out. Yeah, we, we've done it fully by Zoom before and that worked fine, so. Yeah. yeah. Anything else? Okay, great. So we're looking forward to the presentations and we'll see you next week. Great. Thank you.